Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you are doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. All right, today we are continuing our, our look at science fiction games, and we are going to be taking a look at Deep Space D6. Uh, we'll take a look at the base game, and specifically we're going to be taking a look at this game along with the Long Way Home Kind of a solo RPG, choose your own adventure, free expansion that you can get for this game, which, in my opinion, really elevates this game to a to a very, very high, high quality. Uh, I love this game. I'm having a blast with this game. It is a perfect kind of just kind of a, a, a cozy game, uh, a game that you can kick back with some coffee and really have a good time getting absorbed into the world, into the mechanisms, and to having a sense of adventure and exploration. As a matter of fact, it is a nice, dreary Sunday morning here in the Pacific Northwest. I have my cup of McDonald's coffee. Uh, this is not an advertisement, uh, <laughs> but I love McDonald's coffee. It is by far my favorite coffee. Um, and hey, man, if McDonald's wants to uh, sponsor the Dungeon Dive, if McDonald's coffee wants to advertise on the Dungeon Dive, I would be all for that. But OK, so let's talk about Deep Space D6. Uh, the first thing we have to mention is this incredible box. It is small. It looks like an old choose your own adventure uh, game. Just a very, very nicely designed package. This is the second edition which I can't remember when I got this. I guess I might have I guess I might have gotten it on a Kickstarter because it also came with the Endless Expansion, which is an expansion that adds a whole uh, new deck of cards and some new rules to the game that you can play. And you can easily uh, combine the expansion with the base game. So what kind of game is Deep Space D6? As the name suggests, it is a dice rolling, dice uh, laying, kind of a worker placement game with dice where you are taking a spaceship and the game comes with four different ships. It comes with this one here is called the Mono no Aware. Uh, this one here is called the Athena Mark II. This one here is called the AG-8. And then the most bas basic ship is the Halcyon. And I just got to say, I love these little boards. They're so cool. It's such a nice use of components. They're sturdy. Uh, they fold up well. They store in the box well. Each of the ships on the back of the ship has a little bit about the ship, some gameplay notes, a little bit about the kind of ship it is, a little bit of lore. One thing I would have preferred is if the information, the information for one ship was actually on the back of another ship it's on the back of the same ship and so while you're playing the game if you want to read something about your ship you have to flip it over and i don't know it just it, it would be nice if you could just access that information by looking at the back of another ship but in this particular game i am playing the mono no aware and of course all of you uh japanese pop culture fans will know what that means but uh we will be talking a little bit more about why i chose that ship and my crew in just a bit but we're going to go through the base game first. So you are trying to survive. Uh, this is kind of a board game version of, of Faster Than Light, of, of LTL, the, the app game. And uh, you are trying to survive a deck of threats. And these threats are going to be all kinds of different threats. You will have internal threats, which are signified by a red square. And you will have external threats, which are signified by a red triangle. When you draw a threat card, you will place that threat card. If it is an external threat, you will place it on the right side of the board here, matching up its number, which uh, signifies how many hit points it has. So that's how much damage you have to do to this threat to uh, remove it from the board. Uh, internal threats, they go on the left side. And these are things that your crew is having to deal with uh, inside the ship. Sometimes your crew might get distracted. Or there are other things where you can go on an away mission. You can send uh, soldiers down to rescue, or you can send your, your crewmen down to rescue a soldier, or you can boost morale. There are different things that will happen on the inside of your ship, and those are all placed over to the left side. These cards here are from the base game threat deck. 
but they are removed when playing the Long Way Home RPG uh, module. So that's why those aren't mixed in. But this is a Raiders uh, deck, and this threat, it shows that it has two hit points. And during the threat phase of the game, you're going to be rolling a regular D6. And when you roll one of the numbers on the threat card, then the power activates. So in this instance, I would lose uh, one damage to my hull, ignoring shields. So each of the ships has a certain number of hull uh, HP and then shield HP. And you take uh, damage to your shield first and then your hull. And the shield can be recharged by using one of your crew members to recharge the shield. One of the special powers of the Mono no Oware, which I am playing, is a thing called Equilibrium, where at any time, any one of my crew members can actually swap the values of my hull and my shield. And I can also recharge my shields, which kind of is like this weird kind of balancing game that you are constantly playing with this ship. But the threats, there are different kinds of ships that will trigger on different dice rolls with different HPs. Uh, some of the larger ships will trigger on more dice rolls. Uh, usually, the, the higher the dice roll, the more damaging the ship is. There are other kinds of threats. Uh, sometimes you might need to have a, pan, a pandemic that can hit your ship. A robot uprising, uh, a small little fighters are usually pretty easy to take care of. But then there are some really massive like four hit point ships and some very dangerous ships. There is also, if you are just playing the base game, there is also a boss that comes out at the end. And the boss is shown by six cards here with this little circle at the Ouroboros. And uh, it comes out after you have dealt with your entire threat deck. The boss comes out and then you have to uh, fight against this giant ship that is like one kind of ship with all of these different uh, all of these different pieces for one final big confrontation. The Endless Expansion adds it has its own threat deck. So you don't really add this in uh, and it has a whole bunch of new kinds of threats. It also has its own endless boss, which is uh, signified here by this uh, symbol there. And this boss gets um, constructed in such a way where the different dice rolls will trigger different things that are connected to those dice nodes. So that's kind of a new, kind of an interesting way to play that boss. The expansion also comes with a new rule that you can add and you can play with these cards with just the base game if you want. But these are ship upgrade cards and you can assign your crew members to these ship upgrade uh, cards. And as you do, you're going to move this token here along the track. And when it gets to the end, you will be able to flip that card over and you will have an additional thing that your crew can do in order to help you win the game. This upgrade track is something that was incorporated into the uh, solo RPG mode, which we will eventually take a look at because that really is the way that I recommend playing the game, even though the base game is perfectly fun and it's light, it's, it, it, it's quick and it is a lot of fun, but I really like playing with this exploration map and this choose your own adventure book. But uh, on your turn, you are going to be rolling your D6. So these are all of your crew. And then you are going to be assigning those crew to different stations. You have like commander stations, which usually those will allow you to like uh, re-roll or manipulate the dice in some way. You have this green, uh, I can't remember what they, what they actually are. There are actually uh, names here. So you have the commander, you have the science crew. So the science guy is usually going to be using to recharge your stations. You have a tactical crew. The tactical guy is going to be firing your weapons. The Mono no Oware has a different style of weapons than the other ships where you have to lock in other crew members to help you fire the guns. And then when you fire off your, your, your laser, it's going to do different things depending on which crew members are helping the tactician fire the weapon. Really like that. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so far, this is this is my favorite ship. I really like this ship. Let's read a little bit about that ship. So let's see. Um, in the early generations of faster-than-light travel, the United Earths discovered an endless amount of alien artifacts. 
It wasn't until recently that the Mononoa Ware came alive, allowing any pilot it deemed worthy to operate it. Armaments include a complex ablative armor system and intelligent beam weapons that change based on the user. So depending on which crew members you have locked into the laser, you might do one damage to all threats or three damage to a single threat, two damage that can be split up. You can complete an internal threat. So uh, you can use your, your, your medical officers to uh, help an internal threat. Or you can discard the top card of the threat deck, which that is that can be huge because, I mean, you might have like a you might have a really powerful card on the top of the threat deck and you can just discard it instantly. So that's really cool. You also have this infirmary here, and this is where uh, dice are going to go. The crew are going to go when they get when they get hurt. And you can play with just a, a regular infirmary, which has no um, gameplay mechanism except for locking your dice. Or you can have this where you can do a choice where you can choose to send one of your crew members to the infirmary in order to change the uh, face of any other die. And I usually play with that just because I like to have that option. It definitely makes the game a little bit easier, but it also adds a little bit more of a strategic choice that you can make while you are playing. So as you roll the dice and you're going to lock them, you're going to... Uh, assign them to different crew stations and do what they need to do in order to help you get through the various threats. If you ever roll these, these are scanner symbols here, uh, these gray symbols, and those immediately get locked to the top of your ship. And whenever you have a certain number that is represented at the top of your ship, you immediately scan for a new threat. And so you will draw an additional threat in addition to the one threat that comes out on each turn. So it's a way to kind of keep on the pressure. And yeah, that's really what you're trying to do is trying to burn through the deck. You know, if this Raider came out, I would need to do two damage to it. So I would want to have at least one of my tacticians there who could fire the laser. And I would probably want to have, I could lock in a red there. I could fire the laser and then I could do three damage to that, which would knock it down to one knock it down to zero, and then you are done. There are other kind of threats that come out that kind of change the rules a little bit. There are shields that will block threats. There are uh, nebula and things that can, um, they can stop your shields from working. There are solar winds, which when this gets discarded, uh, you automatically lose five to your hull. There's your nebula. Your nebula will, will cause your shields to go offline until it is destroyed. So all kinds of really cool threats, really cool things that you have to deal with while you are playing the game, trying to survive to get uh, through this threat deck. However, I think where the game really, really shines is with this RPG mode, this module that is added on. And this is totally free from the, I think it's Tau Leader is the um, Tau Leader games. If you go to their website, you can download this game. You can download the solo mode or the, it, the whole thing is a solo mode, the uh, RPG mode you can download for free. And on this mode, uh, you have successfully completed a mission, but you are your ship is damaged, you have almost no fuel, your jump drive is damaged, and so you're having trouble getting back home after completing your mission. And you are going to start in this hex here. And your mission, your goal is to get home in this hex here. So you're going to have to uh, travel through these different star fields, these different um, sectors, these star sectors, having adventures along the way. There are one, two, three, four, five different sectors. And each time you move into a new sector for the first time, you are going to roll a D12 a certain number of times. In this case here, you're going to roll that six times. And if you roll any of the little numbers in the corners of these various hexes, you're going to draw a little circle. And that circle represents a planet that you can go down and um, you can go down and explore. So I'm going to have to move the board here. Just give me a minute. And when you go down to explore that planet, you are then going to turn to the page of the book that the uh, that is on the hex. And then you will have a little choose your own adventure that might have some little mini games. It might have some combat, it might have some choices that you need to make 
along the way because you want to get home and you want to start, you want to collect scrap, you want to get fuel, you want to upgrade your ship. And so as I said before, I am playing the Mono no Oare, which is a, you know, a Japanese term, kind of the, uh, the, the, the appreciating the quietness of things that kind of, or, or, or the, uh, the, the kind of the calm before the storm, uh, something like that. But um, I have a whole crew. Uh, my captain's name is Leiji um, Harlock. So for those of you familiar with anime, uh, Captain Harlock and Leiji Matsumoto, um, one of my favorite anime creators and artists. And uh, my crew is Mattel, uh, Tetsuro, Toshiro, and Mime. And so they are trying to get home. On your crew sheet here, you also have these upgrade tracks where you can assign your crewmen to do certain things to repair your engines, to create a kinetic recycler, a biomanipulator, a long range scanners, promotions and cloaking devices. And when you fill up the track, those are going to give you additional things that you can do. You also have this long series of numbers here, which I haven't had to use yet in this game, but at certain points, the game is going to tell you to circle certain numbers or underline certain numbers. And those are going to be kind of like triggers that will cause different narrative things to happen in the, uh, in, in the game. Also, when you create your crew, you're going to have four crew, you're going to have four named crewmen, and, and you're going to pick from a series of words of key words. You're going to pick an attribute and two skills that are going to, those become keywords that might also trigger certain things that happen in the story. You can also get um, different cargo pieces. I have a sys pump here and that doesn't have any mechanical uh, thing, doesn't add any, any mechanism to the game. But at some point, again, that could be a keyword that triggers something in the game. So there are a lot of different ways for you to use the things on your character sheet to manipulate and to augment and to add choices while you are playing the game. So right now, like my ship here, I have just moved into this new sector. I rolled my D12 to figure out where my planets are going to be. So every time you play the game, your possibility that your planets are going to be located in different sectors with different things to read. So there is some replay value. Uh, these squares here, those are like stations where you can go to buy things and you can, you can, um, you can get fuel and everything because every time you move one hex, you're going to lose one fuel. And one of the ways you can lose the game is if you ever run out of fuel. So I have just moved into this sector here. Uh, that is called the Sector Beta, the Free Trade World. And I am on 12A. And so let's see what 12A says here. Uh, Welcome to the Manaport Way Station. No one on Manaport is from Manaport. The station plays host to millions of life forms on transient journeys through the stars. Through a symbiosis of interdependence, it exists without a central authority. Its visitors give to the station what it needs, only asking in return a place to rest. This might not be a bad place to spend some time to recover. Okay, so then we have a few things we can choose to do. We can seek out a job. We can visit the vendor hall for food and supplies. I don't have very much scrap left for trade. I only have one scrap left because I just went on a kind of a spending spree where I bought that sys pump. I bought some fuel. And I also trained up some of my crew members to help me uh, fill up some of these tracks here. So I only have one scrap left, so I don't think I'm going to be spending money. We can revisit the fueling depot or we can revisit the research center. So the research center is where you can go to give you uh, more opportunities to, to upgrade your ship. I want to seek out a job because I want to earn some more money. So I'm going to turn to 37A. And as you can see on uh, the different pages here, you will have, uh, you can sometimes have different things. You have different charts that you can roll on. Um, there are some other little mini games that you can come across in here. There's there's even a star sector within the book, kind of a, uh, this little thing here. I don't know what's going on with that. I've never, never reached that before. Or this here looks like some kind of a pencil game, maybe. I don't know. But yeah, there's all kinds of like really cool little, little uh, mini games in here, but what did we need? 37A. 
odd jobs. Apart from a few simple fetch quests, there doesn't seem to be a huge demand for work. As you ask around for jobs, you are approached by a well-dressed man. He says he is the captain of a delivery vessel, and his ship has broken down on their way to their final destination. The cargo is mostly luxury consumables heading to 20C, so that would be a, um, a sector here, a star sector here, so you might have to go to a certain... Uh, or no, or, that's, or maybe that's a... Um, that could also be a passage in the book. Uh, the food has an expiration date, and in order to make it on time, he has been asking travelers and Manaport to take portions of his cargo to 20C. Okay, yeah, so uh, with a nominal upfront payment of 15 scrap, upon scanning the cargo, your crew confirms that the items are indeed food. If you agree to help deliver the cargo, gain 15 scrap, and go to 49B. You politely decline to take the cargo, go to 45A. Okay, so I want that 15 scrap. So I'm going to go ahead and write that down on my character sheet. So that's going to uh, pull me up to 16 scrap. Okay. And then we're going to turn to 49B. So let's see what kind of damage we have to do <laughs> for taking this job. You arrive at the point only to discover another group of... Oops, no, 49B. There we go. Sorry, wrong one. I did that earlier. <laughs> 49B. Uh, 20C is on the way home, and you have plenty of room in your cargo. Acquire item, Lux, food. Okay, and so we do need to go to 20C, which is actually right here. So we would also write Lux, food in our uh, cargo here. So Lux, food. And so I got 15 scrap, and now I want to make my way to 20C. So I'm just going to draw like a little uh, triangle here. So that just kind of, uh, that's my, my quest marker now. So that's something that I want to do before I get home. So while you are playing the RPG mode, when you are faced with a threat, you will actually just play a normal but truncated version of D6. And the way that works is as you were exploring the star sectors, as you were exploring the book, you will have certain times where if you are in a blank space, you will have to roll a D6 depending on which sector you are in. And then you can either find empty, so no encounter, I mean, you might find some scrap, or you have to do combat. And what combat does is you take the little subset of the threat deck that you are using, and the first number uh, tells you how many threat you pull out initially to begin that combat. So you would place those down like normal. And then the number next to it shows how many additional threat you have to deal with before the combat is over. So in this case, it would be four more cards. So then this becomes now the little game of, of a D6 that I am playing. And as soon as that is done, I win the combat, I can move on, or I can progress through the story. So it really great way to add a completely different layer to an existing game that's already good. The layer that it adds doesn't add a ton of complexity. It doesn't add a ton of rules, but it adds a ton of theme and a ton of adventure. It's such a great way to supplement a game. It's one of the better expansions for a game and the fact that it's free is pretty crazy i mean i would put this I, i'm not going to say like as far as scope okay it's not up there in scope with something like the d100 dungeon world building game but the base game is of a smaller scope than d100 um d100 world building added an incredible layer to D100 dungeon game that made me love that game even more. And Deep Space D6 does that too, but on a smaller scale. The base game is a smaller scale. The expansion is a smaller scale, but comparatively, what it adds is the same as the D100 dungeon uh, world building game. And I just, I, I don't know if I... I can't say that I'll ever play Deep Space D6 without the game, without the, the, the RPG, the choose your own adventure module. 
uh, just because I like it so much. And, it, and it's not like it takes a whole bunch of more effort to play the game. It's very simple. It's very fast. And you're still enjoying a really cool game of Deep Space D6. All right. So let's, uh, now that the review is out of the way, let's continue to look at some more um, cool science fiction art. And of course, I have all of these uh, books still set up, kind of uh, setting the, the stage here, setting my mood for my science fiction month of May. And let's go on to this stack of books here, which includes some really great stuff with some fantastic covers here. So let's see, we have The Traveler in Black by John Bruner. And this I have actually not read yet, but I recently purchased it because I love that cover. And of course, it's done by the great Leo and Diane Dillon. Um, I mean, I, I feel like an entire fantasy game or science fiction game could be made just based on the awesomeness of this cover. This is a really cool collection of three novellas from uh, Mervyn Peake, J.G. Ballard, and Brian De, um, Aldous. And that is Inner Landscape. I love that cover. It's got that cool kind of like 60s, 70s thing going on. But once again, I think this is one that doesn't actually give credit uh, to the artist. But I love that design there. Really cool book here. Uh, Space War Blues. Something that could easily be read while you are playing a, uh, a, a, a fun uh, space opera game. Really funny book. Good kind of satire from uh, uh, Richard Lupoff there. I had this book a long time ago and I unfortunately I sold it. And so I, I uh, recently purchased it again just because I, I remember it so fondly. And here we have a Clifford D. Simak with a Kelly Frias, I believe, cover. Uh, yes. Cover art by Frank Kelly Frias. Uh, Frias's art is awesome. His use of color is, uh, it just, it just pops out. You can tell a Frias as soon as you see it. Hopefully I'm saying his last name correctly. I've actually never, uh, heard his name pronounced. Maybe it's Freeze, but I think it's Frias. Um, our children's children is actually a Simac that I have not read. And speaking of Simak here, we have the Ring Around the Sun, a really kind of cool, um, a uh, cool kind of uh, multi-dimensional, multi-multi-universe uh, book. One of the books that kind of started the whole multiverse thing. And here we have a couple uh, Sword and Planet books from Ray Cummings with a fantastic cover art by Podwill. And it has a few interior images also, but these are really nice old Ace editions here. Uh, just beautiful covers and just gorgeous editions. Um, these books are in such great condition for how old they are. The, 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 the uh, spines are still really strong. The glue is holding up. That's a real issue with a lot of these vintage paperbacks. Even though I love collecting them, eventually the glue is just going to completely give out. And uh, the books are going to become just pieces to view rather than read. But I love those covers there. And speaking of books I'm not reading, these are two of my collector's copies of Waystation. Uh, first edition paperback here. First edition second printing here. Uh, fantastic. Just really evocative covers. This cover, I think, does a pretty good job of kind of not showing what the book is about, but giving an idea of its theme. It's kind of pastoral with a weirdness going on. Really enjoy that cover a lot. But these, the uh, spines are, the glue is really starting to give out. So these are books that I don't read. I have a couple other copies of Waystation for my reading copies. And speaking of Kelly Frias, there's another Kelly Frias. Beautiful colors there. And this is a uh, Stableford uh, Rhapsody in Black. Of course, uh, a DAW science fiction, but without the yellow spine. I'm not sure if this faded or if this didn't have a yellow spine. It looks like it might have faded. It looks like it might have gotten sun damage there. And here we have, this might be a Frias also, but kind of an older, yeah, this is also, you can tell that this is a, a, a 
believe an older style Frius because it's very different than, so this is a Frius as well. It's a very different style. It looks like he had quite a bit of progress from the earlier days through the later days here, but another Stableford here, a uh, promised land. And this is a Keith Bulmer, uh, the Wizards of Centuria. And then on the flip side here is a book, another uh, Stableford, and that is Cradle of the Sun. I'm not sure who did that cover. I don't think that is a Frius. Uh, that is a Jock, Jack Goff, Goffin. Goffin. But all right, well, I hope you enjoyed taking a look at some of these vintage science fiction paperbacks. Let me know if you have some uh, vintage covers that you like a lot. Uh, let me know if you uh, have enjoyed taking a look at these covers as we are looking through all kinds of different science fiction games from the month of May. And of course, we started out today with a look at Deep Space D6, a fantastic little dice rolling dice placing worker placement game with a really cool free supplement that adds a whole layer of adventure and exploration to it. So, all right, guys, we'll talk to you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye.